Hey everybody, Joe here from the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. If you enjoy what we do here on the show and you think it's worth your hard-earned money, you can support the show via Patreon. Just a $1 donation gets you access to bonus episodes, our Discord, and regular episodes before everybody else. If you donate at an elevated level, you get even more bonus content. A digital copy of my book, The Hooligans of Kandahar, and a sticker from our Teespring store. Our show will always be ad-free and is totally supporter-driven. We use that money to pay our bills, buy research materials that make this show possible, and support charities like the Kurdish Red Crescent, the Flint Water Fund, and the Halo Trust. Consider joining the Legion of the Old Crow today. And now back to the show. I ling you your love Hello, and welcome to another episode of Lines Up by Donkeys. Uh, I am Joe, and with me today is Sarah. Hello, Hello. Sarah. Yay, yay, Sarah. Am I allowed to say that with anybody else? Am I cheating on them? <laughs> I don't want to get involved in y'all's relationship. Yeah, it's for the best. We're, we're not quite uh, uh, cemented on what we truly are to one another. Anyway, we're talking about podcasting today. Um, are we talking about podcasting or are we podcasting no, about something else? We're podcasting about something <laughs> else. Um, now, Sarah, you have a show called It Came From The Sea. That's true. Uh, you are our go-to person when it comes to anything to do with the ocean. And also, we talked about things that aren't ocean related, uh, but that's not important. That ruins my, my train of thought. How do you feel about the Pacific Islands? Um, wow, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I've... <laughs> Considering I spent most of my adult life on Pacific Islands, I have thoughts. Mm -hmm. I think generally uh, the islands themselves, like the geology is beautiful. The cultures are very interesting and diverse and deep. And the kind of modern situations all around, not great. So you're saying is you wouldn't want to drop a nuclear weapon on one of them or several of them? No, no. Yeah, I had to, yeah, I had to think about it, but no, that was, that was a layup. Um, you shouldn't want to do that. Um, however, <laughs> <laughs> y- you you know who who did that a lot? The entirety of the U.S. Uh, government in the 1940s through 60s. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> we are going to talk about an uplifting story. I'm I'm lying to you. You um, sound so up- tired already. <laughs> It's about the time the the United States killed the Bikini Atoll. Oh, yeah. Classic. And I need to be clear here. Poisoned vast swaths of the Marshall Islands, which is a independent and sovereign country today. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. I'm sorry. Um, This is kind of funny because I think you might recall one of the first times we hung out, uh, one of the first topics that we both got, like we, we bonded over as friends, was getting way too animated about uh, weird nuclear mishaps that had happened. I believe you're right. Yeah. Really uh, just a classic topic. Yeah. And I, I feel like anybody who knows us will be like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Nothing bonds people faster than getting really excited about the demon core. <laughs> Noted Armenian uh, genius who killed himself <laughs> with a screwdriver and a, 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 a tainted core of plutonium. He thought uh. he was built different. <laughs> Spoiler alert, he was not. <laughs> uh, well, well, you know, one day we're really going to have to talk about that and laugh at a large group of idiots who accidentally just nuked their insides. Uh, now, um, we have talked about uh, nuclear accidents in the military before with like losing bombs, uh, mm-hmm. the, oc- the occasional Soviet submarine that sinks and dies on the ocean floor. And, uh, you know, go listen to those. We're not talking about those today. Uh, we are going to talk about out of control uh, nuclear weapons tests, which had largely unintended consequences. Then everybody just hoped nobody would ever talk about it again. <laughs> to include the uh, the body count, which is large, um, and we will never actually know how many people it's killed indirectly or directly. But uh, it's more than the U.S. likes to admit. I have definitely read about different stuff with the nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands and things like the Castle Bravo testing. Um, but the the actual like amount of people that were directly impacted by it, other than and we'll get into like the the residents of the Marshall Islands, other than like relocating people, you actually don't really see references to 
people who were killed by these experiments. You see a lot of just like, here's how they set up stuff or like, here's what they were trying to test and how like they grossly like miscalculated what was going to happen. But you really don't see a reference to body count, which you do see in like any anything else that you find that's talking about like a nuclear incident. One of the first things that people will talk about is like how many how many individuals were killed. And it's just not a thing that you get with any of the Marshall Islands testing. Right. And I th- I think the reason for that, besides the obvious answer, which is like, oh, Racism. Uh, no need to talk about that, um, <laughs> is that nobody immediately dropped dead. Uh, mm-hmm. So they could they could explain it away like, no, these people didn't die from the Castle Bravo test. They simply all died of uh, pituitary cancer. Yeah. That simply happened afterwards. And we have no idea why. Sudden onset cancer three years later. You can't explain that. Yeah. Yeah. We made the Pacific Islands be covered in snow once by splitting the atom too hard. And uh, mysteriously afterwards, everybody died. Uh, we're not really Unrelated. sure what happened. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Now, in case listeners, uh, if you're not aware, the U.S. is the only country in the world so far uh, to use a, uh, a nuclear weapon in anger uh, twice on August 6th and August 9th, 1945, uh, blinking two cities from the world and ending World War II uh, on paper. After yeah. witnessing this uh, hand of God type destruction, there was a lot of people that began to seriously question the need for a standing <laughs> army or a navy anymore. Um, because when you could just dispatch some dudes who could fly a plane to vaporize an entire city in the blink of an eye, uh, wh- why do war anymore? Okay, that sounds straight up like something Curtis LeMay would try to sell the U.S. government on. It probably had something to do with <laughs> Curtis LeMay. <laughs> 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 Not to mention, there was a lot of people who had greenlighted the use of these bombs from President Harry Truman down to military commanders, down to the guys who had built the goddamn things, who didn't fully know what these weapons were actually capable of Uh, because there wasn't a whole lot of testing done with these weapons before they were used in World War II. This could be because we simply didn't have that many yet, um, the speed of which we wanted to deploy them. And of course, because if you started lighting up the goddamn atmosphere Mm -hmm. enough times, word was going to get out. Had they even done a parachute drop of one to test it at that point? No. <laughs> right, because most of them are just like put up on a tower and, and exploded and detonated that way, right? Yeah, the only test conducted um, before active dropping was just sat out in the desert. Um, and they're like, That's oh, insane. look, the world didn't explode. We're good. Just because <laughs> I know, well, I know like the pilots, like the pilot of the Enola Gay and the other bomber that dropped him weren't like, obviously weren't told a whole lot other than right. like, Right, drop it here and then leave and leave fast. Um, We're not going to tell you why, but you're 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 going to want to step on it, pal. Yeah, yeah, just like beyond. So, like obviously beyond them, just not understanding the kind of destructive force that they were dropping. Not that it necessarily would have changed their mind or anything. No, of um, course not. I believe the pile of the Enola Gay <laughs> went to his grave saying he didn't regret a single fucking thing. Oh, you can find some very not great <laughs> quotes from him. All throughout yes. his life. Yes, you um, can. <laughs> they had no idea what would happen, essentially. Like, they're dropping it. It has, like, a probably a timer for, like, when it's going to go off. And mm-hmm. they're just, yeah, just hoping it doesn't also, like, blow up this bomber. Also probably thinking, like, oh, it's one plane, you know, whatever. Yeah, there was a fair amount of people who just assumed those guys were going to die. Because uh, no, nobody was really sure. Uh, yeah. This eventually led to people within the government really wanting to, you know, broaden their horizons and their uh, their knowledge on, you know, world ending weapons. Uh, One guy in particular is a guy named Louis Strauss. Um, Now, Strauss is an investment banker uh, uh, (laughs) with no education in the field of physics other than what has been called a, quote, passing interest. Okay, to be fair, that kid in Michigan who built a pile reactor in his backyard also had what I would describe as a passing interest in physics. Yeah, that kid rocks. Um, <laughs> uh, I think his name was like Mike Ham, Ham, something like that. Uh, yeah, uh, he built a That's breeder reactor in his mom's shed out yeah. of whatever the material is that is inside smoke detectors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a little bit of, I think, uranium in smoke detectors. <laughs> yeah, uh, he did it to get a merit badge because for some reason the Boy Scouts had a nuclear science merit badge. 
That Which rules. admittedly fucking. This is rocks. why the Girl Scouts has never been cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the Girl Scouts had to settle for uh, building your own ballistic missile, uh, Maribad. No. It's not nearly as cool. It's old if hat. You, yeah, if you unite them together, eh, now you're talking. <laughs> like if North Korea can do it, like it's not worth getting a bad. Okay. <laughs> One of the reasons that kind of piqued Strauss's interest in uh, radiation in general was the concept of radiation treatments being possibly useful for cancer patients. He eventually joined the Naval Reserve due to being medically unfit for active service. Uh, and, you know, their standards were a step lower during wartime. And he uses a very substantial bank account to fund physics research that he found personally interesting. He was involved in the Ordnance Branch of the Navy during World War II, and he was able to cultivate incredibly close political uh, relationships within the machine of Washington, D.C., this is made slightly harder for him because he fucking hated FDR and the New Deal. <laughs> and FDR really fucking hated him. Yeah. He was one of those people that thought the New Deal was like socialism. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I figured. <laughs> I mean, investment yeah. banker, right? Like, right. Sure. Who would have thought that investment banker, not a big fan of the New Deal? Luckily for him and unluckily for Japan, possibly, FDR died during his third term. And uh, Truman became president, who really, really liked him some Louis Strauss. Of course. To show how big of a fan he was, he eventually promoted him all the way to Admiral, which was virtually what? unheard of for a guy in the Naval Reserves at the time. Yeah. What? <laughs> Get close enough. And they'll, like Truman's like, he's an Admiral now. And everybody's like, what? But he's like, he doesn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. He also shows up like one weekend a month. <laughs> uh, two weekends a year. Um or two weeks, whatever. Fuck, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Eventually, Strauss found his way onto the U.S. Interdepartmental Committee on Atomic Energy as the Navy's representative. And again, investment <laughs> banker. Uh, oh, fuck. Yeah. So it's just a whole bunch of people forming Washington's uh, policies on atomic energy after, like, literally months after we figured out it wouldn't wipe out the Earth by, like, igniting the atmosphere or whatever and one of the yeah. guys is an investment banker yeah this probably Just, explains a lot <laughs> i mean you have like military professionals quote unquote like macarthur and aforementioned curtis lemay too so it's like i know i know qualifications don't really mean anything actually but nah yeah come on meanwhile the scientists are like please stop putting your dick and balls on the bomb We've been telling well, there are you guys some of those this. scientists who would absolutely do that, though. Yeah, that's true. I mean, they were the guys who killed themselves while trying to fuck around with a screwdriver with a with a core. Several of them were the people who would like just out of like pure like petty whatever, um, create the in- like create the infrastructure for climate change denial <laughs> <laughs> because people told them they were nuclear physicists and they weren't climate scientists, and their response was "fuck you." <laughs> I'll do what I want. God damn it. <laughs> yeah. Reagan will listen. <laughs> yeah, he, you just have to make an appointment after his astronomer leaves. That's right. <laughs> now, a lot of the people on this interdepartmental committee, investment banker or no, were quite curious on uh, what uh, more uh, applications for uh, nuclear weapons were. Because remember, they had just dropped it on the city. They haven't done anything else with it. They're like, okay, but like, what oh, if... Yeah. We don't do war crimes with it. Can we are use we, our we military targets? Operation Plowshare. Oh no, no. Uh, that, okay. That's a that's okay. a that's a topic at length. Probably for yeah, a lot of people are like. What if we blasted a fucking <laughs> lake in the ground? <laughs> fucking incredible, man! How long it took to make the Panama Canal? Fuck that! <laughs> like, <that's laughs> it's it's the Staples commercial for the easy button, but there's just a fucking mushroom cloud <laughs> in the background. <laughs> Okay, but we're not talking about that. Well, I promise I'll save that at length for a different time. Um, you know, like we knew, okay, this is the make city go away button. But what if like we dropped it on a Navy while it was out at sea? Like, you know, hypothetically, you know, uh, another Pearl Harbor is happening and we see a Japanese fleet. Well, not the Japanese anymore. A Russian <laughs> fleet uh, out at sea. Like, what if we fucking nuke them? Would that work? What would it do right. to the ships? Right. Now, Strauss, being the naval representative on the board, was determined to show that the Navy would be fine in the age of atomic warfare and dropping a nuke on it wasn't that big of a deal. He's not even just not a physicist. He also is just like not somebody who's been around Navy stuff, really. I don't think he was even ever on a boat. 
mean, he was a Naval Reserve guy in D.C. Yeah, right. His uniform is, makes as much sense as a guy from the Sea Org. <laughs> he's got like three ribbons and it's like his marksmanship and his national service defense. <laughs> <laughs> but he's an admiral. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, he wanted to drop a nuke on some boats. And Who wouldn't? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, it probably would look rad from the outside. And you actually can watch videos of this test as long as yeah. you ignore everything that happens afterwards oh and before. Yeah. Very, very bright, pretty lights. Watching the middle five minutes of Radio Bikini. <laughs> and I should point out here, the modern day, we see something like this. And we assume the Navy was just trying to get more funding, like every defense contractor, affiliated yep. journalist talking about why some country has totally left the U.S. in the dust, about some weapons development or another and go back like two weeks talking about supersonic fucking missiles in Ukraine or something. You know, this shit happens all the time. But at the time, this is a serious question that people weren't quite so sure of. And the military industrial complex wasn't quite what we know it as today. Um, It was still there, of course. And Eisenhower would famously warn everybody about it in a couple of years. And that warning would be completely ignored. But, you know, we were already balls deep in the Cold War. Uh, People were curious what the future of warfare looked like. Right. People were invested on the future of warfare in the situation. The president made sure an all civilian review board was put in charge of any naval focused nuclear testing because would you believe it? Truman's like, if we put the Navy in charge of this, they're yeah. going to fuck with the test to make the Navy look good. What? Like, pretty forward thinking of Truman, quite honestly, because of course they would do that. We still do that. <laughs> yeah. I've seen Sergeant Bilko. Like there's a famously this thing going on right now of uh, the army is fielding what effectively looks like a dune buggy um, as like this this quick uh, deployment vehicle for like six guys. Right. Every single field test done by soldiers. Every soldier is like this thing fucking sucks. Yeah. Like it has no armor. It's uncomfortable. We can't fit into it. it Yeah. Yeah. And the like the company that built it. I. I want to say, uh, um, I can't remember what it was, but uh, they're like, uh, actually, the contract's already been signed and we're producing them anyway. <laughs> I mean, classic, right? Just, yeah, yeah, obviously. Now, I mean, other branches were in on this, too, and we're mm-hmm. pretty dead set on making the Navy be honest with the test, but also trying to make sure they looked as bad as possible. <laughs> if they cut funding from the Navy... The army's probably going to get it, right? Or the yeah, Air, yeah, Air yeah. Force is going to get it. So, like, the army insisted on using more ships, and then the army Air Force demanding that each ship be loaded with fuel, oil, and ammo to make it as oh realistic God. as possible. The whole time, Louis Strauss is probably like, "God damn it!" <laughs> That's just all in the water now. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's more. There's worse things to worry about. That's about to happen. If it makes you feel any better. No. <laughs> and uh, and so was born Operations Crossroads Test, yeah. and uh, it, which was opposed, would you be shocked when I tell you, by virtually every scientist that actually works oh, for yeah. the government? Because all of this is being done independent of any kind of scientific review. Oh, of course. Well, because like after after the bombs were actually dropped, basically after FDR died, like before the bombs were even dropped, like, a good portion of the nuclear scientists that had been working on this the whole time that were just like, science is fun. I'm doing science. <laughs> um, really quickly, we're like, oh, I think I've made a huge mistake. We shouldn't actually ever use these. And then noped out, which is like, you know, kind of kind of too little too late there, bud. So everybody left behind is that people like, all right, well, let's see if we could send something into space by stacking nuclear weapons on top right. of one, one another. That's right. <laughs> and now that those losers are out of here. All moderation is gone. Bring in the former Nazis. Right. <laughs> uh, even some diplomats and members of the government were against further testing to include the Secretary of State. Because remember, at this point, the, the Soviet Union hadn't actually detonated their first bomb yet. And they wouldn't until ask, 1949. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we have like no reason to believe that another country is like an equivalent threat at this point. Yeah, probably not. I mean... Um, they probably assumed the Soviets were going to eventually figure it out and they would figure it out making a virtually a carbon copy version of ours yeah. via spies and shit. But like James Burns, the secretary of state point out kind of reasonably that like, Hey, if we keep flaunting how many of these things that we have, that's right. only going to make anybody else want one of these more. Right. 
something could be said for like, hey, the cat's on the fucking bag. There's no putting it back now. But if you point out to everybody, like, actually, we've formed a quite efficient assembly line of destruction. It's going to make other people feel like they absolutely need one, especially if they're in opposition to us. Right. The Soviet Union was in China and everybody else was eventually going to build their own. But we've definitely accelerated it a bit. Right. It wouldn't have felt like a, an existential threat if we hadn't been constantly blowing up the Pacific Islands. <laughs> right. Jesus. Other scientists were like the black-billed scientists, right? Where they were like, mm. okay, well, hear us out. We've never blown one of these up in the ocean. What would happen if we did that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a question you could ask, I guess. Again, on the other flip side of that, the other scientists that were, I assume, office mates with those ones were like, okay, but we've never done that. So maybe we shouldn't. Yeah, right. Like, we don't actually need to answer all of these questions. What if we created Godzilla? Um, And, you know, famously, again, another group of scientists are like, well, if we do that, there's going to need to be people nearby. We know a fair bit about about radiation now. Seems bad. That's going to kill them. Like, we shouldn't do that. (laughs) So, of course, the government went ahead and did it anyway. Yeah. They're not people. They're enlisted. Yeah, they're sailors. Oh, it actually gets worse. I get to say the thing now. Wait, wait. Oh, uh, you uh, did uh, it. (laughs) (laughs) So, the government selected the Bikini Lagoon of the Bikini Atoll as the test site on January 24th, 1946. Now, Bikini Atoll was selected over the other islands around it. For instance, one of them on the decision board was the goddamn Galapagos. Oh, my God. (laughs) Just to make a fucking statement? Just to be fucking the the villain from Fern Gully, I guess. Yeah, right? Let's just blow up Easter Island. Why the fuck not? (laughs) Now, I assumed one of the reasons they were talked out of nuking the Galapagos is because Tortoise. Guys, those are part of Ecuador. Yeah, right? Like, that's part of it. Like, you don't own these places. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything else at this point is like under military occupation, protectorate status, whatever. But like, the Galapagos certainly was not. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck. Now, the Bikini Atoll is part of the Marshall Islands, which is at the time was an American colony under direct governorship of the U.S. military, which at the time was headed by Navy Commodore Ben Wyatt. Four days after the test site was chosen, the 167 islanders who lived on the atoll were told they're about to get kicked the fuck off and were not told why. Now, as you can probably assume, people were not huge fans of this. In order to sell this forced deportation, Wyatt went to the atoll and appealed to their deeply held Christian beliefs, which had been spread to them via Protestant and Mormon missionaries in the mid to late 1800s. Yeah, of course. He compared their deportation from the islands, which no. was their home for many of them, several generations, as comparable to the story of the Bible, where God saved the children of Israel by leading them no. to the promised land. Yikes. Fuck off. <laughs> Now, the islanders led by their chief complied. And I obviously, we have I no mean, way. They didn't yeah. have a choice. <laughs> yeah. It was either like you go with us or you come with us. Right. Yeah. It was 100% coerced. The chief was smart enough. No, he did not have a fucking choice in the matter. I mean, yeah. he and his people had just lived through World War II. He knows how this shit works. I'm just like, I'm blown away by like, it was less than a week, less than a week before, like from. Choosing this place to removing the occupants in a way that, like, obviously, I didn't think they would give, like, great thought to what they're doing with these people. But you, I don't know. I thought they'd maybe have, like, a couple of weeks to come up with a plan for how to, like, discuss it with them and relocate them. Not, like, four days. Surprise! I mean, if you look at official U.S. um, documents to include, there's a video of this, uh, of Mm. this situation, uh, where it tries to uh, show that the chief... A staunch Christian himself would have been like, ah, yes, we are, you know, God's children and we should listen to this. Yeah. However, the video is telling. Yeah. Uh, some of the evidence that the chief knew he was being coerced or, in fact, had been quite literally threatened uh, when nobody was paying attention is that uh, on the video of the chief's submission to U.S. authorities or news cameras, he kept fucking up his prepared lines. 
mm. uh, until someone simply held up a cue card for him. Just like literally so, a thing yeah. that they do to hostages being yes. made to like record videos under duress. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the army built temporary housing for them on Ragnarok Atoll, which uh, was a n- different atoll nearby. Telling Now, I say temporary as in they were one step above tents. Yeah. And the army told them that they would be there for a few weeks, maybe a month. They wouldn't be there very long. They're still there? Uh, oh, we'll get there. Okay. It does not have a happy ending. Yeah. How far away is this island from um, the Bikini Atoll? Uh, not close. Okay, like far enough away that it's 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 completely different. Yeah, safe? Uh, like I mean, I know it's not like no, it's not like their home homeland or whatever. But is it like actually far enough away to be safe from radiation? Nope. Ah, uh, okay. I yeah. mean, the reason for that is um, this test goes wildly out of control. Um, but it, it's also hard to tell with like how the wind blows, et cetera, et cetera. If they also would have been safe. Regardless, it almost feels like this was a bad idea in a lot of ways. Yeah. Now, the reason why they had the chief make these videos is obviously propaganda and optics. Um, this is because, unlike the Trinity test uh, before it, which was the test in Nevada, mm. uh, nothing about these tests were going to be secret. Right. This test was going to be publicized and not just for a domestic audience, but for an international one. Eventually, over 100 reporters showed up to witness and report on this event, uh, making it what the National World War II Museum called, quote, the most observed, most photographed, and most talked about scientific test ever conducted up until that point. I'm going to need some notes on like the use of scientific there. It goes boom. Ah, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Gentleman science. <laughs> okay. I mean, like, just to further prove what the whole point of this test was, Truman moved the test date back a couple weeks so more people could show up and watch it on time very scientific yeah also like completely disregarding like any meteorological like didn't even cross their they, minds yeah. No. yeah exactly okay cool. <laughs> okay, good. three tests were planned uh, as part of operation crossroads uh a hiroshima or nagasaki style air burst known as the able shot a shallow underwater burst called the baker shot and a deeply submerged explosion known as the Charlie the shot. Trump shot, right? Yeah, 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 that's right. None of them. We didn't get down to M for the money shot. <laughs> now they assembled the target fleet that they were going to nuke, made up of dozens of old mothballed navy ships and quite a few captured Japanese and German ones too. In case you're wondering, what are you going to do with all these captured things at the end of a war? Nuke them, I guess. Um, they, they then pack the ships with animals. Um, because you had to test what would happen to the crew. And this included 200 pigs, 60 guinea pigs, 204 goats, 5,000 rats, and 200 mice. They already knew what was going to happen. Like, Like, this this would have made sense during, like, the Trinity tests when they were like, we're not really sure what happens when you get dosed with radiation via explosion. And they they did have animals, like, set out during a lot of the ground testing in Nevada. So right. Like, and not to mention, they just nuked two cities full right, of people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But yeah, they went ahead. <laughs> Over 40,000 men and more than 150 support ships were arrayed outside the immediate target area. Somewhat incredibly, the Navy, remember, this is only a couple years removed from World War II, was mostly still staffed with the guys they drafted for World War II. Oh. And uh, they told the men that they could extend their draft time by one year. Because remember, like this is a decent job for a lot of these guys. Yeah, uh, right. like a lot, a lot of people that got mustered for service during World War II kind of didn't want to leave. Well, there's also like a big difference between like serving in the military during a time of war. Like not not all in bad ways either. Like you do actually have something to do. You do actually have like a sense of purpose. Where like a peacetime military, especially a peacetime navy, is a lot of just like nothing in yeah. a way that right like isn't motivating. Isn't necessarily something you want to stick around in. Yeah, and a lot, but there was a fair amount of people who did. And one of the things that they dangled in front of people to hit those numbers, maybe mostly because they didn't have enough people in this task force because they were all about ready to muster out. So, like, mm-hmm. fuck, we gotta we gotta keep them in somehow. Reenlistment uh, contract benefit here: you extend for one year, you get to watch the nuke go off. You know, if my chief had presented me with that when I was getting out, uh, that would have got me. I probably would still me. be in. Yeah. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Like, look, 
Joe, you can re-enlist for three years and we will nuke a mountain for you. I'm like, fuck yeah. <laughs> like, you shouldn't be doing that. But if I can't stop you anyways, well, you know. Yeah, the nuke's going to go off whether I re-enlist or not. I might as right. well be one of the guys that gets my eyes turned to cancerous tumors. Right. You get at least 50% disability for that. Yeah, what's the VA? Actually, I, the VA rating for these guys is... Uh, oh, my God. Not good, like uh, unfortunately. 17%. <laughs> the VA has decided to see you that... Your nuclear-related cancer is not service-connected. Yeah, 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 it could have come from anywhere. Yeah. Now, the able shit... Uh, the able shit. <laughs> <laughs> now, the able shot went off on July 1st, 1946. The Baker shot went off July 25th. And according to the government, they were both fundamentally the same device. Uh, they are implosion-based uh, plutonium bombs. However, the results were not the same, nor what anybody was expecting. So the able was in the air, and then the whatever the B one was was like shallow, right? Yes. Okay. Um, the able shot was dropped out of a plane, which okay. missed its target by a half mile. Of course, it's, couldn't have known. And um, this, of course, will be part of one of the many cascading safety failures that happens. It detonated above ships that were not meant to be targeted. Oh, uh, now they weren't supply ships uh, or like the service ships with the crewmen on them. However, they were uh, part of the fleet that had uh, the, the mothball fleet that had been loaded with measuring instruments so they could measure oh. the data. So they nuked their own data collection repository. <laughs> this is where I'm again, once again, just can you really call this a science experiment? Did you yeah. really do all the steps to make this a science experiment? Because I'm not sure you did. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say if the bomb would have landed on target, you could feasibly call it science. However, they literally just nuked their own science. Yeah. Because they can't even measure it. Right. Yeah, you just, whatever, whatever, fuck, whatever, fuck everybody here. Now, to the surprise of most people, and honestly me, this bomb was kind of a dud. Uh, oh. It did damage to the ships close to the epicenter of the blast, but uh, outside of that, damage is quite minimal. And since it was just an airburst, it didn't contaminate anything as much as people figured it would. I mean, it did spray nuclear contaminants in whichever yeah. direction, but it wasn't as close. Um, it didn't spread it as much as they thought it would, etc. It was kind of a failure. Part of the stuff that spread a bunch of the nuclear material in Nagasaki and Hiroshima was the fires. So I guess that makes sense, right? If you don't have a bunch right. of like paper and, and thin wood to like be irradiated and then catch on fire and then spread ash around. There is just like less material to carry radiation. Right. And like the fallout can't get in the smoke and be easily right. carried by the wind. Like this just right. literally falls into the ocean or falls on a ship that's made out of metal. And full of your recording equipment. So full of your you actually, co recording you equipment. Can't yeah. anything. All right. Now, this actually was such a letdown. It was like, nah, <laughs> that sucks. That the, journal <laughs> the journalists like left. Oh, my God. Like a lot. There were still some there, but a lot like, oh, boo. And they left before the Baker shot uh, started. Oh God, send the intern next time. Yeah. Uh, now, Baker went sideways, let's say. <laughs> now, this was the world's first underwater nuclear test. Uh, right. People were really rolling the dice, not entirely sure what would happen. Um, and I this mean, is according. Uh, <laughs> this I is mean. where we talk about the first whale to get superpowers. No. <laughs> Scientists know. Scientists have known for so long that water is incompressible. And so, like, what that means, right, is, like, when you set something off in the air, air is very compressible. So, like, the act of the air squishing together and spreading apart will, like, absorb some of the energy. Water doesn't do that. So, like, just to say, like, if you're setting off an explosion underwater, like, you know, you know that the, the size of the space taken up by the explosion is the amount of water that's going to be moved. Like, that's just how it fucking works. So, like, I'm, just, I'm already mad. I'm already ups I'm just upset. I'm actually People really say. glad you explained that uh, because I couldn't. You're the ocean <laughs> person. Um, uh. And and rather than try to explain why something went so seriously wrong, I'm going to quote directly from the historical radiological assessment um, because it's uh, catastrophic uh, to use a word. Quote, the first effect of the blast was a tremendous bubble of water and steam that broke the ocean surface. Then a yeah. huge wave, over 90 feet high, later called a base surge, rolled over target and support vessels. Remember, the support vessels are the ones with people in yeah. them, as well as the islands of the atoll. 
Vast quantities of radioactive oh debris, primarily consisting of fission products, radioactive elements resulting from fission or splitting of the bomb's plutonium, unconsumed plutonium from the bomb's fissioning core, and radioactive sand and coral that had been irradiated by the intense neutron radiation from the blast rained down on the target and support ships, islands, and lagoon. This unexpected outcome caused the contamination of both target and support ships, the extent of which depended on each ship's position relative to the zero point of the blast. Twelve of the ships in the immediate area of the detonation exploded and sank immediately. Jesus. Whoops. Just, I... (laughs) Like, okay, I knew knew that there would be a lot of water displaced, but when you said it was a shallow burst, I, for whatever reason... um, forgot that they were on an atoll which is like an atoll is a collapsed underwater volcano so inside is a crater in the middle of a kind of a ring of what looks like a a circle of an island holy shit i didn't know that so they effectively put it in a cannon to fire outwards i just (laughs) so i guess whenever anytime i had read about this i knew like right because i have i have read about it some um you just I thought it was in the open ocean, I guess, because a lot of the tests that they would do in the Pacific Proving Grounds would be just like in the open ocean. Yeah, those occurred after this for a reason. <laughs> yeah, because I'm just like, well, what the fuck did you think was going to happen if you just had it like suspended near the like the one shallow bit of sea floor that you had available? Like, the fuck? Again, this I believe this is what happens when the scientists are like, maybe you don't do that. And they're like, I'm going to do it anyway. And like, all right, I'm going to see myself out. Yeah, that's a good point. That is a really good point. There probably were people just like, this is this is going to cause like radioactive fucking cement to rain down on top of people. And then you just had to add and rolls and whatever going. Ah, but what if it didn't? <laughs> Not to mention a 90 foot wave of radiation <laughs> slapping into your boat. Yeah. Now, Jesus Christ. you would think going into, say, a large scale nuclear tests Sarah um one of the, the things you'd have in place is a decontamination process no they didn't what at all <laughs> nobody even thought about how to decontaminate a ship because remember we're in subboard ships we're we're not going to get hit by any I- of this stuff we're safely in the distance so they just they just didn't have one i i guess i just always assumed like one of the hospital ships is just like around because that you know good news it's also radioactive now oh my god (laughs) oh my god well jesus Uh, the the contamination spread to the entire support fleet and almost as soon as the bomb went off so much contamination was thrown in literally every single direction that president truman's like uh we're gonna go ahead and cancel the 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 charlie shot (laughs) well at least he is capable of making good choices once in a while i guess We've already talked about what is the science here, right? Yeah. So let's talk about what they discovered. This is from the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Quote, a large ship about a mile away from the explosion would escape sinking, but the crew would be killed by a deadly burst of radiation from the bomb, and only a ghost ship would remain, floating unattended in the vast waters of the ocean. Also known as things I just assumed before this happened. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, <laughs> duh. <laughs> this also, like, like, okay, wait. Jesus so- Christ. This would also mean that their tests, like what? Okay, practically, right? They're looking at the practical effects of nuclear weapons on on a fleet at sea. So if a fleet at sea is what you're trying to combat and you've just set off a shallow water nuclear device, are you expecting to set up a bunch of like nuclear sea mines in the open ocean and just hope a fleet triggers them? Good news. They worked on those. Why? Why? I mean, th- I mean, right, they worked right. on nuclear landmines, torpedoes. They had a, they had a fucking air nuclear air power missiles. yeah jet at one point that they were trying. Yes, to, the whatever. ram jet. It was a doomsday yeah. machine. That thing fucking ruled. <laughs> like the, the 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 nuclear ram jet is quite literally something that should only exist in a Marvel comic book. It's so wildly evil that yeah. it was scrapped pretty quickly because even the scientists were like, "Guys, what the fuck are we doing here?" <laughs> <laughs> are the best because it, it it required it to spread radiated debris as it flew oh yes yeah there would be no way for it to come down other than to cause a, a nuclear explosion so yeah if yeah. you fired it in a direction you are in fact accepting that you're ending the world because everything along the way is going to be glowing 
it doesn't it's not related to this but i'm pretty sure the point of it initially was like we could create a jet that could fly non-stop and never need to refuel um, yes but then yeah then then the other issues came into came into how course, do we like, stop it <laughs> it'll never stop that's the point if you want an unstoppable plane and you got it yeah, it was building the unstoppable plane that would also hold more nuclear weapons on board yeah, uh, yeah. i believe yeah. it, i mean it, it's literally something that like comes out of warhammer 40k like nobody would actually attempt to build that until it happened and then everybody like took a good long look at themselves in the mirror and like come on guys let's let's just go back to planning to nuke the moon instead you know yes. this one was a bust yeah yeah this looks really bad uh for the future yes. of naval operations in the atomic age and the navy knew it especially because the public knew all about the tests and most important the test animals all died um yeah. so that's bad if you're the guy who's like pro navy in the situation where we i mean of course i'm not glossing over the horrible effects it's going to have on the islanders we're getting there Knowing these animals were standing for sailors, the guy running the test, Admiral William Blandy, quickly told everybody it wasn't that big of a deal if everybody died because dying from radiation was, quote, virtually painless. Oh, <laughs> oh I don't know about that one. It's like legitimately the worst way to fucking die unless you're immediately burned out of existence yeah. and turned to ash. Yeah. It's- awful and unless they you're knew at that. the epicenter yeah unless unless you get like actually vaporized no if you're just like hit with a wall of radioactive water it- it's gotta be awful oh i mean they all knew this was a lie remember yeah. again the u.s had just nuked two cities and it had hundreds of thousands of, of people that proved them wrong in this situation right right they had had multiple scientists at this point like accidentally over irradiate themselves and then been able to study the impacts like this isn't come on they knew even before they nuked two cities that, ooh, radiation really fucking sucks to die from. Yeah. On top of all the dead animals, which remember, there's fucking hundreds of them. A lot of them. Um, thousands of sailors had been dosed while attempting to clean up their own ships because, you know, oh. no decon process. And with that, let's head back to the displaced islanders because things were not going great. Oh. Now, the government had dumped them on their new island for what they thought was going to be a few weeks to a month. It was now clear to the government that uh, this is going to be a a bit longer. Also, the government then decided they're going to keep Bikini Atoll for future testing. Fuck the Islanders, right? That makes sense. I mean, they've already made it completely like unlivable. Uninhabitable, yeah. Yeah. The Navy had dropped some food supplies um, for a few weeks on Ragnarok Atoll, um, assuming that's all they were going to need. And then they fucked off. Those supplies Uh burned through pretty quickly. And, you know, remember those people were used to their previous island culture and the ecosystems that exist there, fishing, hunting, trees, whatever. They couldn't figure out how to survive on this new island. Uh, It was completely different. This led to intense food shortages. and, uh, And that was only made worse by a fire that destroyed their crop of coconut trees. A year later, when a U.S. medical team checked in on them, they realized that they had kind of created an accidental island death trap. With no way out and no way to provide themselves with food, the islanders were dying of starvation. You like you can't even call it accidental. It's not like it's it's fully just negligent. One hundred percent. Yeah, the forced relocation was one hundred percent on purpose, and the uh, the the bad planning for everything else is incompetence and uncaring. Like a- after they realized they weren't going to move anybody again, they could have given them more food. They simply didn't. They didn't even fucking check in on them. Right. That's so. Like that's part of this too. Is like they didn't check in on them. How? Like, how would they have been able to communicate even back to the Navy to, like, let them know things aren't going well, you know? Like, yeah. Remember, this medical team is a year later. Yeah, right. And it's not like this is a time when phone lines are, like, really common in areas that are just, like, islands in the middle of the ocean. Because you have to have a physical phone line at this point. Right. And this is widely reported in newspapers at the time with the blame falling on the Navy rather than the U.S. government. Ah, like, yes. ah, this is a naval failure. The government didn't have anything to do with this. Yeah, our sweet, innocent federal government. Yeah. Only two years of wrangling afterwards, the military finally moved them again, this time to Kwajalein Atoll in March of 1948 and stuffed them into a tent city, which ran alongside a massive U.S. military airstrip. But they weren't there for long and were moved again to Kili Island. Now, once again, food shortages became a serious problem, and people struggled to adapt to their new forced way of life to the point that the UN had to give them a cargo ship to use for food transports. It was eventually sunk in a storm. Oh, my God. Were they the only residents of that island? Yes. 
there was nobody there before for a reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And like at least at least for that interim period where they were next to an airstrip, like they had a chance of talking to somebody of like getting any kind of information or like asking for any kind of aid. But by like moving them again to an island that is uninhabited is just the like we don't really want to look at this problem that we've created. Right. Especially in like, you know, in over the course of, you know, however many hundreds or thousands of years of Polynesian uh, migration across the Pacific Ocean, if yeah. an island wasn't settled on, yeah. there's a fucking reason for it. Right. <laughs> like people probably showed up they're like wow nothing here moving on it's not yeah like it's not like voyagers just didn't know that island was there <laughs> <laughs> right um now unfortunately for the uh, bikinian islanders uh the u.s military was not done rendering their island into a radioactive hellhole enter operation castle yes yes so by the time of Operation Castle, the control of nuclear testing had finally been handed over to a, a civilian control panel known as the Atomic Energy Commission, which still exists okay. today. Yeah. FYI, uh, Louis Strauss made them jump over <laughs> so many different fucking obstacles to get to that point. Did he just like really not want to give up control of like oh, whatever? Oh, oh, don't worry. He was still on that commission. <laughs> he was one of five commissioners. Oh, my God. Okay. Jesus. <laughs> In the meantime, the U.S. had continued bombing the living shit out of the Marshall Islands, specifically the Anowitak Atoll. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they had also forcefully deported around 100 people from and Bikini Atoll, which had become known as part of the Pacific Proving Grounds, most of which was open ocean. But there was also, you know, these previously inhabited places inside of it. In between Operation Crossroads and Operation Castle, at least nine nuclear weapons have been detonated there, including Ivy Mike, which was the world's first hydrogen bomb. Um, though saying hydrogen bomb isn't quite accurate either. Uh, Ivy Mike was uh, in such a testing phase that it was massive. Like it was so large. It was a building. What? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't air droppable. It wasn't an ICBM because they weren't invented yet. Right. It, it was um, like a collection of systems that were so large that they uh it, it literally looks like a building oh yeah uh like the soviets themselves referred to it as a quote thermonuclear installation rather than a bomb Jesus. yeah okay i mean it was insanely huge um uh, like according to historian keith zambala it was effectively a factory uh oh it, that was made to put out this kind of energy and it was so powerful it permanently reshaped the atoll yeah so i like i knew about Oh, oh, yeah, it looks like a silo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, the, the, the ability to hydrogen bomb ourselves uh, outpaced the ability to make them small. Um, but unfortunately, we have since eclipsed that gap. Now, okay. uh, <laughs> of course, you can't weaponize an entire building. So Operation Castle's Bravo shot, uh, or Castle Bravo, uh, also known as a shrimp device, um, was yeah was going to be a dry device, meaning it was going to be much lighter and much smaller, allowing it to be possibly deliverable. Um, mm. Though it, it was the first step of many that would allow it to eventually be dropped out of a plane one day. Okay, was it? Wait, was it also hydrogen? A hydrogen bomb? Yes. Okay. Okay. So that's why it's the first like quote unquote deliverable hydrogen bomb. They were working in that direction. Yeah. Um, Operation dry, Bravo so or dry. Operation Castle was going to consist of seven different experiments, each with a slightly different device using different fuels. Some were wet, some were dry. You know, yeah. Lob that one up there. <laughs> <laughs> I've got nothing intelligent to say in response to that. <laughs> <laughs> wet ass hydrogen bomb. Where are my girls at? <laughs> For comparison, the Bravo shot weighed 23,500 pounds oh with a theorized okay. yield of around five megatons. Ivy Mike was 10 megatons, but, you what know, it was the, the size of a factory. The Hiroshima and Nagasaki were in the kiloton range, yes. right? Uh, yeah. So Fat okay. Man, the, the bomb dropped on Nagasaki not even 10 years before at a yeah. yield of 21 kilotons. Right. For dumb people like me who aren't aware of math conversions, <laughs> 1,000 kilotons equals one megaton, and one yeah. megaton is equal to one million tons of TNT. Yeah. So, bomb, bomb big. Orders of magnitude. Just yes. fucking ridiculous. Okay. 
And once we uncork the bastard of splitting the atom to make people blink out of existence, we didn't stop going back to that well for a while. Yeah. Jesus. The the Bravo device was sat down on an artificial island in Bikini Atoll, which was like loaded with diagnostic equipment and stuff. Um, And then set off on March 1st, 1954. And uh, immediately people realized like, oh, someone had fucked up pretty bad. Was it? So it was over the water or un- underwater? It was on top of an artificial island okay, on, so it was on like the water. Floating, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. It was like a buoy, but a, an evil buoy. <laughs> a buoy <laughs> with a little goatee painted onto it, you know? Right. You can't trust them. Within one second, a fireball formed that was almost five miles across Ooh. and visible for 300 miles. Oh my the mushroom God. cloud reached to 47,000 feet and grew to seven miles in diameter in the span of one minute. It continued expanding for 10 minutes, growing to 130,000 feet high and 62 miles in diameter at a rate of oh 100 God. meters per second. I just imagine everybody on the observation platforms like actively pissing and shitting themselves because that's 10 (laughs) minutes where you don't actually know whether or not you've maybe just ended like all life on earth guys is it gonna keep growing guys where's (laughs) it gonna stop yeah exactly exactly there's people like laying on the ground with paper bags over their heads just waiting for it to end (laughs) remember this is supposed to be five megatons yeah it was 15 (laughs) now this is 1000 times more powerful than the bombs dropped on japan And it fired off radioactive contamination in an uncontrolled fashion that nobody was ever prepared for, for 7,000 miles in every direction. Oh, my God. Did it hit the atmosphere? I believe so. Yeah. Jesus. Fallout rained down the surrounding islands of Rognalap and Rognarek. But remember, Rognarek is the first one they were resettled on. Yeah. But Fallout made it as far as Australia, India, Japan, and the U.S., as well as parts of Europe. Oh my God. So much fallout landed on Rognalap Island or a atoll that children thought that the white powder substance falling on them was snow and they <sighs> ate it. Ugh. They all died. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's According what happens to- when you like just eat something and your pituitary gland is going crazy because you're a child. Just fucking pops like a balloon. Oh my God. According to the National Institute of Health, quote, during the second and third decade after the accident, most of the wrong lamp children and adults had developed thyroid nodules, most of which turned out to be malignant. Yeah, duh. Several people from the surrounding islands suffered immediate onset radiation sickness, including vomiting and losing their hair. Yeah. This is normally considered fatal as well. Like if you start vomiting after a a nuclear event, you're going to die. Right. Almost always. So yeah. you can assume these people also immediate casualties, which are not counted in case anybody's keeping track. But the ocean is not an empty place. On top of these islands, it also happens to be full of ships. Enter the Lucky Dragon number five, yes. a Japanese fishing yeah. vessel with around 23 men on board. Now, since the U.S. thought the bomb was not going to be as big as it ended up being, nobody had extended this exclusion jo- zone yeah. that they tend to broadcast when they're testing. So the crew of the Lucky Dragon 5 thought they were clear of any danger because according to the maps put out by the U.S., they should have been. The Lucky Dragon was only 95 miles downwind of the test when Bravo went off. Yikes. You know, you can say a lot of things about the Soviet Union and it's like just complete disregard for the value of life. But when they did most of their tests in Siberia, they at least like did take into account things like wind and they... You know, they did. I'm not going to say they told everybody in the area that like to to leave or anything because they absolutely didn't. But when they did things like dropping the Tsar Bomba, like their scientists actually did calculate like the radius they expected and they were actually trying. They were actually trying to predict like what was going to happen ahead of time. That's as well as long as you leave out the the polygon um, in Kazakhstan. Um, oh, and I'm like, again, not not at all trying to defend <laughs> the Soviet Union. I'm just trying to think of like the other time they exploded something that was too big. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, theirs was more of a, I don't know, murder by a thousand paper cuts or something. Yeah. Um, I mean, the polygon is a awful, awful thing. We'll talk about it eventually at some point. Uh, but that was their testing ground. And oh, boy. Yeah. No, and I like they also did not remove a lot of the people who were indigenous to Siberia when they were doing testing. But. 
just no they did not <laughs> something about the like something about putting it over the ocean where it's like things are the most likely to spread very far very quickly is yeah it's just a different kind of like complete complete negligence and I, I mean comparing this to czar Bama, like they built czar Bama to be the biggest bomb on earth yeah yeah exactly it was very intentional yeah whereas like this was a fuck up Oh, yeah. Um, And the science behind the fuck up, honestly, I don't quite understand. It was something that like something reacted differently than they thought it would. Yeah. So when um, and I'm not like anywhere near a nuclear physicist at all either. But as a nuclear physicist, please go on. Oh, yes. Let me explain. (laughs) Um, No, it is essentially when you have uh, when you have a bunch of like ingredients together for any kind of chemical reaction or any kind of like Wait, what's going to set off a chain reaction, right? Uh, one reaction that will like the energy of which will start another reaction, the energy of which will start another reaction. Um, if you were to look at like the energy put into the system and the energy you expect to get out on a graph with an X, Y axis, it would it would pretty much be like a linear slope of some sort. There'd be like a pretty clear like, you know, you put in twice as much material you get twice as much explosion or something like that or twice as much material three times as much explosion like you'd have some sort of relationship you can look at Mm -hmm. but with with almost every system like this there is a point at which that relationship changes and so my understanding what happened with castle bravo was essentially they were assuming that the relationship was going to continue to be this like very obvious and um, predictable we put in this much material we put in this much energy we will get right this like normal factor of growth when we get energy out um and they just hadn't like physics wasn't advanced enough to predict this and they hadn't obviously tested anything this big so they just didn't realize that like well no actually if you put in like three or four times more material than you have before you're not going to get the same response you're actually going to get like up uh, just a much, much bigger response out of this material. Um, and it <laughs> it's one so of those things where like... like a wild runaway chain reaction type basic, deal, maybe? Yeah, yeah, basically. I'm trying to think of like a way to compare it to something more common, but I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now. Yeah, you, you got me. I mean, like, I mean, it's easy enough. I'm, I'm not, I don't know shit about science in general, but like, I kind of understand that. I don't know. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. It's it's just like it's one of those things like, yeah, they probably couldn't have physics probably hadn't advanced enough like theoretical physics for them to have figured this out. Like they probably could not look at previous explosions and the kind of the numbers that came out of that and predicted that it was going to be this big. But at the same time, they didn't need to be doing it. Right. That's the simplest answer. The whole thing is like, yeah, they didn't. There was no need for it to be this big. <laughs> yeah. If at any point you're unsure of the science behind your doomsday device, simply don't use it. Right, right. And at some point, like, you know, spoilers, I guess, for like the mid 60s and 70s, at some point, scientists did eventually get that. Yeah. (laughs) But like, maybe we shouldn't do this anymore, guys. Yeah. We did kind of just blow up an entire, like, atoll worth of like homelands for people in order to figure that out. And of course, uh, uh, the 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 most insane reaction to this would be like this was worth the sacrifice to learn these things right. and like fuck off, fuck like, you. I'm, not, I'm, I'm not even entertaining that bullshit. No, no, it literally wasn't. These like there was nothing that we gained out of almost any of these specific proving ground tests that like needed to happen. No, of course not. Um, it so one lucky dragon crewman, um, who remember was only 95 miles away from the blast, oh said, quote, a yellow flash poured through the porthole, which I have to say is a bad fucking sign if you can oh, see yeah. colors. Wondering what yeah. happened, I jumped out from my bunk near the door, ran on deck, and was astonished. Bridge, sky, and sea burst into view, painting a flaming sunset. I looked around in a daze and I was totally at a loss. And then oh the white ash began to rain down on them. Oh, my God. That's like really fast, too. Yeah. Having what? no idea what any of this was, many of them touched it with their bare hands. Ugh. Ugh. What time? What time of day did this happen? Was it at night? Uh, I believe it was in the middle of the day. Oh, wow. OK. Uh, within hours, every man on board became violently ill. They experienced pain, headaches, nausea, dizziness and diarrhea. Their eyes began to turn red and they de- oh and developed an itchy mucus. Ugh. Oh, wait, was that like conjunctivitis? Isn't there like a specific type of conjunctivitis? Uh, pink eye. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think it, it it could also be like radiation burns or something oh, on their eyes because uh, some of them looked at it with unprotected yeah. eyes. Um, now uh. they they figured out like they were they had no idea what had happened to them. Um, however, they fi- they thought that this ash probably had something to do with it, right? Yeah. So they collected some into a bag um, to bring home with them for analysis, but they kept it that bag hanging from one of the bunks. So it was right next to them during their entire trip back to Japan. Okay. I'm just going to say at this point, that was just a bad call on their part. It was a bad call. Like respect figuring out that the mysterious sky ash was probably killing you. But also, if you think it's killing you, maybe don't hang it up next to your face while you're sleeping. I'm going to go on a limb here and say if there's one group of guys who might have known what would have been happened to them, it's a group of Japanese fishermen. Come on. Like, you you know what You need to create the world's worst dream catcher. (laughs) <laughs> oh, God. Now, by the third day, the crew had begun to develop uh, small blisters anywhere that had been oh touched by the radioactive ash. Their faces began to turn a dark red. And by a week later, still not home yet, they lost their hair. Now, if there's one group of doctors that were familiar with the, right. with the side effects of being fucking nuked, it was Japanese doctors. And it did not take long for these doctors to take one look at these guys and be like, holy shit, what happened? Right. Like, how did this happen to you? Right. However, quick medical attention did not mean these men were had a good road ahead of them. In case you're unaware, if radiation sickness does not kill you immediately, it is, as we've talked about, the worst fucking way to die. Yeah. Um, the crew had to stay in hospitals for over a year, getting a battery of tests and treatments done while they were bleeding from the inside out as their DNA oh. slowly turned against them and their blood cells evaporated. They were given constant bone marrow and blood transfusions because one of the things radiation does to you is destroy your bone marrow, causing a chain reaction across your entire body, shutting it down one system at a time before you can even generate your own blood. Mm. In September, Kubo Yama Ikichi, one of the crewmen, finally died, having lost his mind and having to be secured to a bed. The other 22 crewmen were discharged from the hospital in May of 1955. Virtually all of them would eventually die of cancer. Honestly, I'm amazed that that they that any of them were able to be discharged. I am it too. It took them a week to get home. Yeah. I do need to point out that there is something of a thought. Uh, it's not completely supported, but I wouldn't mm-hmm. fucking doubt it that local American doctors in Japan were kind of using them as test subjects. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which they have been found to have done for a lot of the survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. They sure were. And since yeah. this is like literally 10 years later, like, guys, you're really going to do this again? You're, okay. Right. Somehow, after all of this, testing went ahead. After Operation Castle, dozens more nuclear weapons were set off in the same area to include Operations Hardtech and Dominic, where 71 different devices were tested. Oh, my. Too many. That's too many. Yeah. We have too many of these. Finally, testing ended on the grounds of the Pacific Proving Area in 1963 with a partial test ban uh, treaty that banned atmospheric and underwater testing of nuclear weapons because, yeah. Yeah. And that was like, that was something that was done from my memory, basically, directly in response to Russia setting off Sarbamba was when those talks began. Yeah. For the partial test ban. Yeah. Now, you might be wondering... Whatever happened to the hundreds of people who may have been relocated and impacted by this? Well, mostly generational food shortages. Only three years after the Castle Bravo test, Islanders in Rongelap were returned home and immediately began getting sick. Wait, what? They sent them back? They sure did. In 2007, a report by the CDC by radiobiologist Ulrich Berling said that scientists at the time were fully aware of the risks and put the Islanders back anyway for research purposes. Oh, what the fuck? Yeah. Doctors also conducted experimental and unnecessary thyroid surgeries on Islanders for 30 years. What? Wait, what? Surprise! What kind of surgeries are these? Uh, I assume uh, on their thyroid to probably biopsy uh, to see how yeah, radiation is right. affecting yeah, the ones sense. that don't have cancer. Yeah. Then in 1967, President Lyndon B. Johnson noted aficionado of his own dick, decided yeah. to return the Bikinian people following an Atomic Energy Commission study that stated, quote, well, water could be used safely by the natives upon the return no. to Bikini. It appears that radioactivity in the drinking water may be ignored from a radiological safety standpoint. The exposures of radiation that would result from repatriation, the Bikini people do not offer a significant threat to their health and safety. 
Yep. Like, just in 1968, uh, Johnson told 540 forcefully di- displaced people that he was going to allow them to return to their homeland, saying, quote, it is our goal to assist the people of Bikini to build on these once desolate islands a new and model community. Why were they desolate? desolate? Like, yeah, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> they weren't desolate when you showed up and people had been living there for generations. Thus, I- a eight-year plan was formed to make the islands, quote, habitable again that'll fix it you know everybody knows radiation only takes like five eight years max to get cleared up yeah um this included doing things like planting crops like coconut trees and giving them a chance to mature so they can harvest them yeah Yeah, so the coconuts that are just yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) oh Oh, fuck. Late in 1969, the commission said, quote, there's virtually no radiation left at all, and we can find no discernible effect on either plant or animal life. By 1971, people were moved back in. Oh, of course not. Nor did they eat the crabs. We'll get there. <sighs> Only then was it discovered that coconut crabs retained an incredibly high rate of radiation because yeah. they ate, you guessed it, the husks of the coconuts, which yeah. retain even higher levels coconut? of radiation. <laughs> really changes Moana. <laughs> that's how that crab got formed. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like that in particular, that uh, the way radiation is taken up by plants that has been known for like a very long time, because when you plant something that fruits that like bears any kind of fruit or vegetable like produce, uh, most of the radiation that it will pull out of the soil will be held within the fruiting body of a thing. Like that is just known. What's incredible is they're rediscovering the concept of the food chain, but like via racism, like you already knew this fucking happened. That is, the, like, that is the American <laughs> way for being, being honest now, here. Th- if you follow this back to its logical source, if the coconuts are being contaminated, that meant the groundwater was contaminated. And holy shit. We moved these yeah. people back into a super fun site. Uh, no, just, no water on the island, no animal that lived on the island and no food grown on the island was fit for human consumption. Oh, my God. So, of course, the U.S. immediately moved them off, right? Right? 10 right? years? 10? 15? <sighs> yeah. The U.S. did not move these people immediately. Instead, they put out weird rules. To be fair, the U.S. was busy with like this little thing called Vietnam that definitely <laughs> needed to happen. Like they, One of the rules were like, uh, don't eat or drink anything on the island. We'll send it to you. I mean, that's basically just like living in Red Hill on Oahu right now. Yeah. Uh, by 1978, the U.S. finally conceded they'd have to move them again uh, yeah. when it was discovered that every single person on the island had 11 times more the amount of cesium-137 yeah. in their bodies than anybody ever should throughout the entirety of their lives. Yeah. Fully 10 years later then. Yeah. Jesus. Since then, the U.S. has dragged its feet in court, lowballing any settlements or you know trust funds that should be set up for the victims of its testing. When the Bikinian people brought this to the U.S. Supreme Court, the court refused to even hear the case. <sighs> yeah, a fucking Supreme Court always, uh, always uh, nothing but slam dunks, right? Bunch of old fucks. None of them should ever feel safe. Even the ones I like should never feel safe. They should feel just as safe as any school kid in America. Yeah. Since then. Uh, some amount of cleanup has been done with topsoil oh. from various different atolls. Um, uh-huh. It was then all locked away under a cement tube, a uh, cement tomb on an island. Though yeah. uh, works uh, that they popped on top of it. Yep, yep. You, you want to yeah. know what uh, the the seawater is doing to that whole thing? Seawater is notoriously yeah. like not you know difficult for any kind of engineering project to overcome. And Sarah, um, now tell me what happens if you plop an incredibly heavy cement sarcophagus directly down on a beach? I'm just so mad. It is. It is basically <laughs> the ultimate seawall here. Yeah, no, it's that's. Uh, 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 yeah, it's uh, it's, well, it's not going to do anything. Yeah, yeah like it's like leaking. It's leaking real bad. Putting a cement cap on it was never going to do anything right like it's not going to prevent the loss of radioactive material because the water coming up through the sand underneath is just going to pull it all out anyways and then because you have yeah like this massively heavy just cement cap on top of this thing it is going to create pressure like it's going to be fucking heavy and that's going to cause the land underneath it which is sand and coral to just shift and sink more and then release more radioactive material yeah all the radioactive equipment that's buried will simply Go back into the ocean. <laughs> <Ugh>. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> Did they hire the Army, Army Corps of Engineers to build this? I believe they hired a coyote uh, who only went named by, <laughs> went by the name Wiley. Oh my god! Just when did they? So what, I know that I know the cap is leaking. Um, oh yeah. When when did they establish the cap? Like how long has that been there? Uh, I think the seventies. Uh, uh, okay. Now, as for the independent Marshall Islands, they are still living with the effects of largely uncontrolled nuclear testing to this day. Thyroid conditions are so common that people have theorized that the Marshallese tradition of passing stories down via song will die out. Because so many people are having cancer, they can't fucking talk. Well, even if they have children, like, radiation will move into an unborn fetus. Like That's right! Yeah. Yep. Thousands of people were directly exposed to radiation at the time of the contamination through the environment or secondary problems but from uh, contaminated people having children. Right. Uh, and which has only increased thyroid conditions like cancer and hyperthyroidism by 10 times the amount of the U.S. mainland. All cancer rates across the board double, with liver cancer rates being 40% more than anywhere else. Though a report from the University of Hawaii at Manoa says the rates are actually probably way higher due to the yeah. fact that the Marshallese Islands have very bad healthcare infrastructure, meaning that fewer people are reporting illness, meaning right. that their statistics are fucking low. Right. And if you have something like liver cancer, like thyroid cancers uh, will often often result in a tumor that is pretty visible. Um, yes. But no, if you have like other like cancer of your soft organs, like you're not going to know. It's just going to hurt really bad and then you're going to die. So like, yeah, none of these none of these numbers that are being reported unless you actually send out teams of epidemiologists to go and like you know, directly study any of this shit. You're never going to know. You're going to have yeah. this plausible deniability. And I saw one report that said uterine cancer and and uh, uh, and people was like ninety percent higher than the mainland. God. Yeah, it's fucking. And this is the mar. These are like uh, the Republic of the Marshall Islands. This were these were not islands that we directly dropped nuclear weapons on. This right. is all cascading effects that remember everyone would have known about. This this is not new. They did not discover that the wind takes fucking radioactive material. Right, exactly. I think that's like that's what I keep coming back to, I guess, with this story is that like at every point it wasn't even willful. It wasn't even like intentional. I guess that's what I was trying to get with the Soviet Union stuff is like when the Soviet Union like killed people because they just didn't feel like emptying out Siberia. They knew they were going to do it. And it was it was just they knew it and they didn't care. And that was like that made it an intentional act in a way that like, OK, you're actually admitting some sort of responsibility or at least some sort of culpability for like the pain you're causing people. But with the U S it is like fully not even stopping long enough to think about the people that you're impacting. Right. It is just like different (sighs) shades of the same colonial racism. Oh yeah. 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 Exactly. It's, it's, and that is very American, right. To just, especially for like our government in particular, just to not, to not even consider other people and like in that kind of like very passive way uh to to ruin lives uh right. it's it's disgusting and it's like it's frankly insulting for anybody who was affected by these things yeah it's it's awful in 1988 the marshallese government formed a nuclear claims tribunal with american funding to pay damages to victims that would require a lifetime treatment uh, which i need to be clear here is the entire island yeah but the United States never financed a tribunal like they said they would. And in 2007, the money that they did give ran out. By then, right. the tribunal had paid $91.4 million to about 2,000 people, two-thirds of whom had thyroid diseases uh, or cancers. Well, I'm like, what does, that, what does that do for people at that point? Nothing. It's out of money. Yeah. yeah, they, yeah they have you're, nothing. You're giving individuals money, but you're not like building any kind of infrastructure or giving them the money, like giving their government the money to build infrastructure to actually make hospitals that can manage all of these things to like provide medicine. Like you, it's not doing yeah. anything. And and remember, like we've talked about, this is a problem that's literally going to be virtually perpetual. Yeah. Their soil is contaminated. So anything they grow will be contaminated. The yeah. animals that they eat will be contaminated. Their children that they have because they're contaminated will be contaminated. Like, this is something that will not go away, whatever the fucking half-life of this shit is, you know, a million right. fucking years or whatever. Um, and you know, they stopped giving them money. Um, now, this continues to run rampant without control or medical treatment with no end in sight, as, uh, as well as little to no cleanup efforts any- anywhere. Effectively, 
the United States killed the Marshall Islands right. before it ever gave them independence in 1986. And in closing, uh, in 1947, a uh, Marshallese islander named Lore Kesabuki wrote uh, effectively an anthem for his island of Ragnarok, which he'll never be able to go back to. It says, quote, no longer can I stay. It's true. No longer can I live in peace and harmony. No longer can I rest my head on a sleeping mat and pillow because my island and the life I once knew there, the thought is overwhelming, rendering me hopeless, helpless and in great despair. And like... I've seen some really weird, fucked up tourism pieces that have come out because obviously the Marshall Islands are desperately attempting to have an economy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and one of them was from like outside uh, the magazine outside online. Okay. Um, that tries to like spin it, spin this in a way like, oh, you can eat the crabs. You can only eat like one a day. Um, no. Because of course, one of the things that happens is, um, you know, because of these uh, abandoned areas uh, forcefully, abandoned areas right. um it's apparently very good for scuba diving that i would believe yeah so like that's like something that's sprang up in the economy since then but like come on man come on right like they shouldn't have to shouldn't have to rely on these things right so that's the uplifting lighthearted story sorry sarah <laughs> i thought i got the fun ones I feel normally like. you do yeah. get the fun ones but now you get a depressing one because of uh, of wetness no, I mean, Castle and Bravo, as we established, was very dry. That's yeah, true. It's, it's, yeah. it's a problem. Remember, just, folks, always apply water-based lubricants to your nuclear devices. Right. Yeah, if you use silicone, it can degrade the material. Yeah. Just because the other, I guess the other thing, too, is like, what would people compare this to? And like, all I can think is like, oh, I bet there's some like awful, like dipshit travel journalist who has called this like the Chernobyl of the Pacific or something. Um Oh yeah, I saw like, like lots of people that compare it to that. When like the 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 direct yeah. comparison is the polygon because that's virtually the same thing that the Soviet Union did was right. drop a fuckload of nukes in the middle of Kazakhstan and without telling anybody. Right. And to this day, of course, people having to deal with the horrific after effects of that. Comparing this to Chernobyl is not it, right. No, because like Chernobyl. But Chernobyl was an actual accident. It was an actual accident. It was caused by like a completely different kind of like neglect. But then there's also like the amount of radiation released was like, I guess because that's it, right? Like when they put people back on the Marshall, uh, back on the Bikini Atoll in um, the 70s, like you can't compare that to the people who remained in the irradiated area around Pripyat because like that level of irradiation was so different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was just, like, it's not comparable it, at all. Yeah, rather than a, a runaway bomb compared to a, a you know a meltdown. Um, well, and like not even just the one bomb, right? Like, um, I so if you look at pictures of the Marshall Islands, um, yeah, seventy one bombs. My bad. <laughs> right, no, you, and you can see the craters actually. I've seen these things kind of like out of context, but not like with the full story kind of being told all at once. Um, but no, you can you can see like full craters, like lagoons that have been created by atomic blasts in that area and you can just see the pock marks um that are the result of like this you can call it testing but it really wasn't right like they weren't really testing anything so much as they were just fucking around right right of course and that's you know the same thing that i mean even today in like nevada there's fucking places that are insanely irradiated yeah, yeah. um and that's that's fucking awful i'm fairly certain like groom lake and a lot of the other testing areas were had been reservations, had been like areas where of like, course they fucking the, were the indigenous populations Jesus of the US Christ. had already been like pushed into these areas that were like arid and were basically devoid of like the ability to grow food and then further pushed off so that the US military could could fuck around. Um, uh, of course that's what happened. Right. Why why would it be any other fucking way? Jesus. So Christ. it's it yeah. Yeah. <sighs> now I do have something uh to 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 let us exit out the gate on a, on a happy note. Well, maybe not. You really don't like horses. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we do something on the show called Questions from the Legion. If you'd like to ask a question from the Legion, support the show, go on our Patreon, add your question to the ever-growing thread, uh, and I, I will pick it. Um, so today's questions, uh, question from the Legion is, would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? Oh, did you get this question off of Reddit in 2014? Um, I guess. I mean, I would fight the duck-sized horses. Ducks are scary. A, a horse-sized duck? I don't it's think terrifying. so. It's terrifying. Yeah, no, thank you. But a bunch of horses I get to just, like, punt? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
how are they coming at me? Is it like like one at a time, like an action movie? That would be fun. But also, if they're all coming at you at once, what if you just got like a big push broom? <laughs> yeah, get get on out of here, ducks. Uh, like the the idea of a horse sized duck is terrifying. That's like yeah. six hundred pound duck with a, a weird twisted cock the size of a baseball bat charging at you. you okay, wait. You think the you think the horse size? I guess horses were always hanging dong. So I guess a horse yeah, horses duck hang might. mad dong. Yeah, and since it's horses it's like. Awful. It's uh, uh, adopting all uh, all kinds of like horse characteristics. It gets the weird horse people teeth too. Oh, well, some ducks have teeth. Oh well, yeah, but like the horse ones are weirder because they look like people teeth. I don't know Do why I look- find that so disconcerting, but I don't like it. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever considered horses as having people teeth, but I grew up it's around really horses, big so people teeth. I mean, I okay, they don't feel good when they bite you. Well, of course they don't. Yeah. People don't feel good when they bite you. Well, unless you're into that sort oh, of thing, yeah. but like yeah, yeah. whatever. But like it's like that weird fish that has people teeth. I really don't oh, like. Oh, a lot of a lot of fish have people teeth. You're talking about like I hate that. Fish? I fucking hate that. Yeah, probably. Yeah, they look dorky as fuck. Fish. Yeah, you need braces. Put braces on the fish. That's ableist. <laughs> Being ableist to a fish. That's how we're gonna close out this episode. Sarah, uh, pl- plug your show if if you're into more uh, uh, ocean based stuff. Listen, yeah. listen to Sarah's show. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, I have a podcast as well. It's called It Came From The Sea. Um, I have a mysterious collection of background stuff about the ocean. And so I um, I use my background knowledge and just stories that I find interesting to kind of try to explain the ocean and ocean science in ways that I hope are uh, more approachable to people who are kind of off put by the idea of learning about science. Wait, you mean uplifting stories? Like you don't talk about nuking the sea oh, repeatedly? To be fair, no. Uh, I I cannot say that all of my episodes are uplifting, as I have been told multiple times. To can we please stop talking about climate change? <laughs> uh, hey, if I've become the genocide podcast, you're becoming the climate change podcast. That's just what we have to do now. I have one that's not about climate change, but it's depressing because we learn about how um, overfishing caused Ebola outstanding <laughs> um everybody listen to sarah's show and also thank you for listening uh if you like our show consider supporting it on patreon even a dollar gets you all sorts of stuff like discord access bonus episodes early episodes uh or if you if you don't want to spend money consider leaving us a review it's good for algorithmic based reasons that i do not understand but it's free so you know cool um also until next time don't nuke the pacific islands <laughs>